So welcome to the show. Uh, we're very pleased to have you. Um, did you eat already? Or are you going to eat after? You no, finish your... Just walked in from practice, so I That's appreciate the flexibility on the schedule. No problem. Um, how much time do you have with us? When is when is dinner time? Because dinner time is important in, in Italy, uh, right? <laughs> Especially when in Italy, you got to get your pasta. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've got about 45 minutes, so about 8.15. Perfect. You know what? We'll try that. There's a lot of people who want to ask you some questions. So uh, okay. welcome. Thank you again. Good practice. Uh, good practice. Yeah, I think they're all important now that we've named the Olympic team. We don't have very many practices left. So I think there's a sense of urgency to make sure that we're taking advantage of every opportunity to get better. That's a good point. So the way I'm going to work, John, is um, um, I'm going to have to translate on the fly. But the way it goes is I'm going to tell the French people what I'm going to ask you. Of course, your French is so good that you'll know the question that I got before I asked you. Then you answer. We have some kind of exchange there. Keep going. Keep walking. I'm going to write down. So if you see me put my head down, it's because I'm writing down your answers. And then I'll give you, I'll give the French people the main topics for the main ideas that you get. Does that make sense? Yep. Sounds so great. I'll, I'll, I'll tell him the same thing. So John nous expliquait qu'il revient juste du, euh, de l'entraînement et qu'il allait manger dans 45 minutes. Donc c'est assez important. Comme on le sait tous, la bouffe est importante, la nourriture est importante. Donc on a 45 minutes de John. Euh, il disait que l'entraînement maintenant est très intéressant puisqu'ils ont réduit l'effectif. Ils ont nominé, ils ont nommé leurs 12 joueurs. Donc maintenant, ils peuvent peaufiner les informations. Et donc j'expliquais à John qu'on va parler. Je vais vous expliquer les questions que je vais poser. Et puis après, je les poserai à, à John. Donc la première question qu'on va poser à John, Uh, Coach Sparrow, on va, lui, on va lui parler de la VNL sans aller directement sur comment uh, les États-Unis vont jouer contre la France, mais lui demander comment ça se passe, comment est l'équipe des États-Unis, comment est l'évolution et qu'est-ce qu'il va faire maintenant, qu'est-ce qu'il va faire jusqu'aux Jeux Olympiques. So John, uh, Coach Sparrow, John, thank you so much again. Uh, the first team that we got here is the VNL. So we heard that the, the food is apparently okay, the organization is apparently okay. You confirm it's not bad, right? There is less travel. Yeah, less travel is a really nice aspect of this tournament. I think uh, it's The conditions are far better than we probably expected because the hotel has a nice courtyard. It's got a swimming pool in the back and they're allowing us access to the beach. So honestly, I, I was afraid I'd be stuck in this hotel room and be not and not even see the sunshine for 40 days. And uh, it's not been the case. It's been pretty nice. So I think it's a good competition and a good condition. Yeah, I can see it's, it's a nice it's a nice uh, uh, room that you got there. I don't know if they got the. Uh... You know, <laughs> Could it's I... okay. You know, I, I, I'd give you a tour, but it's not that big. You know? <laughs> it's still good. Um, how's the uh, U.S. team? Like, uh, you guys came. So I, I'll be frank with you. I'll be direct. You know me. Um, it was challenging. You had you had some people who were hurt, like Taylor and Matt and everything. It was challenging from a coaching perspective. The goal from your team, like the French team and the Polish team, is the Olympic Games. Let's not fool each other. Right? This, this is what we want. We want the goal. So you come there. And as a coach, you look what you got, you know where you want to go, you got all this challenge. Tell us how you approach the beginning of the competition versus right now where things you got the 12 and maybe, you know, tendonitis are better. How, how is it going through the whole VNL with all the team that you got? Um, we always tell our players to take it one point at a time, one yeah. match at a time. And I think I needed to do the same thing. Uh, I think you could start to get big picture and start thinking about the Olympics um, and get a little distracted from the, the task at hand, which for Team USA was um, fairly unique. I think every team has battled injuries at different times, of course. Uh, but for us to, to, at the beginning of this tournament, not have Aaron Russell, Taylor Sander, or Matt Anderson. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> was, I mean, that's probably 80% of our offense over the last seven, eight years. And uh, so I think a lot of people probably didn't understand that Matt was injured and ramping up. Taylor, what was his progress? Um, and and we were we I listened to the trainer about what we needed to do to, to get our players healthy and playing their best volleyball in Tokyo, which meant, you know, maybe not taking as much risk or pushing them now and making sure that they remained healthy. So I, There's probably some people that were thinking I was making decisions on rosters because I needed to evaluate players for the different Olympic spots. Um, I think the circumstances allowed me to do that, but honestly, more than I probably would have preferred. I would have preferred to put our team together earlier to have everybody healthy and uh, 
play as a, a team more than I did. I just had to take the circumstances as they were and go out and do the best job we could. Yeah, thank you. Let me uh, let me explain that. So a lot of good stuff. So ce que le coach Perron nous explique, c'est qu'il euh, c'est qu'il explique toujours à ses joueurs de prendre un point, un point après un point, et de pas se focaliser sur le long terme, mais vraiment de progresser petit à petit. Et c'est ce qu'il c'est ce qu'il voulait faire. C'est vrai que l'équipe des États-Unis avait eu euh, euh, avait eu des joueurs qui ont été blessés. Hein. Euh, Russell n'est pas là, Taylor Sanders n'était pas là, Matt Anderson n'était pas. Donc c'était assez difficile. Ça fait quand même il disait 80% de son euh, de son effectif de l'attaque. Mais en fait, si euh, c'est vrai que le rôle qu'il avait dans cette VNL, là, justement la question qu'on a posée, c'est qu'il voulait évaluer ses joueurs mais en même temps il pense que les blessés en contrepartie il n'aurait pas il n'aurait pas en voulu autant il aurait voulu pouvoir les mélanger les, les non blessés que ce soit Anderson Taylor Russell et puis les nouveaux pour pouvoir évaluer uh, et c'est comme ça qu'il voit qu'il voit son truc pour l'évaluation pour la VNL so thank you again um, the mental of the team um, how the team the team is starting to get tired we heard about like the French team and some of the other teams like look it's been six weeks we're away from our family happy yeah. Father's Day by the way Thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, what is happening now? Like, it's tiring. You're probably not going, like, I don't know if the final four is one of the team for you, a game for you. Are they going home after? Are they, you know, how's the mental of the team? I think the mental mentality of the team right now is pretty good. I think it, it, it's, it's always good to get to the place where you can name your Olympic team because it starts, it's as much as you want everyone to be competing for the team it's inevitable that a lot of the players are worried about themselves and making that roster. And, and once you name the Olympic team, you can start focusing on the team again. And so I think that that's a, that's a big moment in terms of how you put together a team um, in this particular summer. Um, so I think in that respect, we're in a really good place. Um, In terms of the fatigue, I think you're right. I think even today in practice, as much as I mentioned that there was some urgency and value in every single practice you have because there's not many of them left, I still could see that there's just a little bit of fatigue that's playing into the, the emotions and the focus on every point. And uh, I noticed it last week for the first time. I, I just think last week when we were playing the Netherlands, we just looked tired. And so I think we do need to go home, take a little – take a little time off. It's a balance. You need to train to get yeah. better. You also need to make sure the guys are rested and capable of focusing. And so we'll have to discuss that and make some decisions here, but uh, yeah, it's, it's striking that balance and making sure you have time to get everybody where they need to be to play well in Tokyo. So, so before I translate that, so the goal there for Team USA is to finish the competition, go back. Everybody goes back to California to the, to the, the training, or okay. they go back home for a couple of days. You'll all go back to California to the training. Yeah. There's some okay. teams that can't, they have to stay. They, if they go yeah. back, they have to quarantine for 14 yeah. days. I think Argentina's like that. Canada's like that. We're yeah. not like that. So yeah. we can go home and see our families and train for two weeks. And then we're going to go to Mishima city for a training camp and play Japan twice on the 17th and 18th of July. And then go to the Olympic village, train for four more days and then start the competition. And you start against a team we really know. We'll talk about it before. But let me let me translate that. So what Coach Perron nous expliquait à propos de, um, de, de, de du mental de l'équipe, c'est que le mental est très bon pour l'instant. Et surtout que comme il a décidé qu'ils étaient les, les 12 derniers joueurs de l'équipe des États-Unis, maintenant les joueurs se soufflent un peu. Ils savent qu'ils sont soit pris, soit pas pris. Et donc, il peut se refocaliser euh, sur un esprit d'équipe sur ces 12 joueurs. Mais il a aussi s'est rendu compte que le mental était un peu un peu bas dans ces derniers entraînements, euh, que les, les joueurs n'étaient pas encore là. Ça fait très longtemps qu'ils ont joué. Donc, ils ont expliqué que, contrairement au Canada, on a écouté Lionel Bonheur tout à l'heure, les États-Unis peuvent revenir. Donc, ils vont revenir chez eux dans leur entraînement en Californie. C'est là où ils s'entraînent dans leur, dans leur euh, région, l'air. Ils vont pouvoir voir un petit peu leur famille. Et puis, euh, ils vont après repartir au Japon. Ils ont deux matchs contre le Japon, le 17 et le 18 juillet. Euh, et puis après, ils repartent pour l'entraînement pour les Jeux Olympiques au niveau du... Euh, euh, au, au, au quatre jours, quatre jours d'entraînement et après il joue la France. Euh, ce que je voulais maintenant poser, on va comme il parlait des Jeux Olympiques, John Spiller, on va continuer sur les Jeux Olympiques. Je voulais savoir comment il a construit une équipe, parce qu'il est en train de parler une équipe, et comment on construit une équipe de haut niveau par rapport aux équipes qu'il peut construire quand entraîneur, en tant qu'entraîneur de, de, de université. So John, the uh, coach Spiller, the, um, the great great uh, uh, talk you have right now is how you build a team. Um, And, and I, you can probably talk about hours on how you build a team for the Olympic Games, but I presume it's very different from UCLA. 
Um, and building a team from Olympic Games, you're not just looking at Nate and say, give me the best passer and I'll take them or give me the best attacker, right? There is probably more to it. Like, so tell us, tell us what it is. Do you, do you pick your best player and then you build around them? Is there a little bit of magic behind it? Yeah. I, I think there probably is a little bit of magic. I think if it was just, let's take your best player, um, it'd be easier. <laughs> it's yeah. hard. It's hard to build a team and the, they always talk about team chemistry and how to define that, I think, is very challenging. Um, I think for us, we've been fortunate because I think we have a lot of talented players that are also very good people. I think sure. they're very good teammates. I think we're, yeah. we're fortunate in that regard. Um, but I think there are players that contribute um, in different ways, and some of them are really valuable in non-volleyball ways. Leadership, um, a voice in the locker room maybe somebody that can talk individually with younger players. I think there's a lot of that type of interpersonal dynamic that I think is very, very important on building teams. So I think you do look for that, particularly with the role players. Uh, if somebody's not going to start, they, they probably need to contribute in, in other ways as well. And, and we do have a lot of that. I, I think one of the great leaders on our team is Kavika Shoji. You know, he's, and so I think as, as we were making decisions about the backup setter, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm unless somebody gets hurt. I mean, I'm not taking Micah Christensen off the court. So if that's the case, what does that backup setter bring? I think the intangibles that Kavika showed you brings from a leadership perspective factored into the decision. And that's just one example of maybe the decisions coaches need to make in order to make sure they have a, a real cohesive team, because I think you need to have internal voices. It just can't be the coach. The best teams are the ones that have internal leadership and inter internal guidance and ownership over the process beyond just a singular voice of the coach. And that's true with staff also. But I think in general, we have quite a bit of internal leadership, which I think is really beneficial for us. That's interesting. Are you, are you studying this uh, interpersonal dynamic, making sure that you got some data about who's the best leader or not? <laughs> it's, just, a constant, it's hard. It's constant, but it's a constant dialogue amongst the, the staff and yeah. with the players and defining what their role is and, I think communication is so important. I think it's more important than it used to be. I, I, when I played at UCLA back for, I don't know if you know Al Skates, but he was a legendary U, U.S. coach. And um, I, I think about the years I was at UCLA as a player. I think I maybe had like one team. I had maybe one meeting with him. You know, yeah, that's true. And, yeah. and I, I did, and that was okay. Like I'm not even sure he knew my name the first couple of years, and that was fine. No, back in those days, no one cared. Now I think players today really do value the relationship with the head coach. And I think that's, that's really, that's, that's good. I think it challenges us, us as coaches to understand our players, what motivates them, what they want, how do we make them better? Um, but it does require more time and a more of an, uh, a personal relationship. So I, I think that type of conversation about the interpersonal dynamic amongst the players, amongst the staff, I think takes a lot of time, but it's worth it. I think it makes for better teams with the players we have today. Very interesting. Um... Let me translate that because this is, this is a lot of valuable stuff. So, what Coach Cheo nous explique, c'est qu'il explique, euh, donc on parlait comment construire une équipe et, et comment il choisissait. C'est vrai qu'il disait, je ne prends pas que les meilleurs joueurs, il faut qu'il y ait une espèce de, euh, de, de relation entre les joueurs. Donc, il nous, il nous parlait de, du fait qu'il a beaucoup discuté avec les joueurs, que par exemple, il a pris un joueur comme Soji, qui est le, le deuxième passeur. Il disait, si je, si je pouvais, je garderais Christensen sur le court tout le temps. C'est vrai que je, je le prends, Soji, parce que c'est un vrai leader, c'est un vrai, un vrai organisateur de, derrière. C'est un. And it's a good setter too. Sage is a good setter. C'est un, yeah. oh, yeah. un bon. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. That's another thing. Mais c'est un, un bon leader. Il, il permet d'avoir de, 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 la dynamique de, de gagner. Et ce qu'il nous explique qui est assez intéressant, c'est qu'il dit que dans les équipes qui gagnent, il y a des, il y a des voix intérieures qui ne sont pas les voix des coachs ou les voix du staff. C'est-à-dire qu'il faut des joueurs à l'intérieur qui puissent se motiver, qui se motivent eux-mêmes. Euh, c'est comme ça qu'il construit, qu construit son équipe. Il disait aussi que la relation entre... Euh, entraîneur et joueur est assez importante quand il jouait à UCLA il avait rencontré son entraîneur qu'une fois euh, il pense même que l'entraîneur ne connaissait même pas son nom la première année euh, et c'est vrai que l'évolution du volleyball en ce moment et on va peut-être en parler euh, c'est le temps qu'on passe entre les entraîneurs et les joueurs pour pouvoir améliorer euh, améliorer les joueurs euh, donc je vais, ah bah je vais continuer là-dessus sur cette espèce de, de communication et, et, et d'améliorer euh, d'améliorer les joueurs et comment on peut augmenter et, et, et et faire améliorer les, les équipes internationales. So I'm going to jump right on there on this communication, John. Um, if you have a crystal ball, um, how do you see the international high-performance 
men volleyball evolve? And I'll tell you, I'll give you a couple of hints uh, so you can think about it. BIC was invented by the US a couple of years ago and it became prevalent in, in, the, in masculine volleyball. And now if you look at March, uh, a March in, in Vakiv Bank, she's doing it on the third step, right? So it's becoming also for the women. Mm-hmm. Um, right side, right side became huge. I mean, Matt is one of the best one. And, and again, that was one of their stuff. Um, what is what do you think is going to happen in the next couple of years? Do you think it's going to be even faster, rip and go? Do you think it's going to be um, defense? Do you think it's going to be more like serve? Like, so the French team is working on the serve. Um, but again, if you have a Leon that can serve 134 clicks an hour, you're not going to change that. But where do you see the evolution of the men international volleyball in the next two, three years? Um, that, that's a great question. I think you're, you're right about the BIC. I think if you had to look back over the last 10 or 15 years, the most influential aspect and in change of the game is probably the BIC and it's probably just the velocity of serving. I think it's just a, really a, a huge part of the game today. Um, I think offenses are continuing to evolve. Um, I think you're seeing some more variety of the middle routes. I think you're seeing different even faster tempo VIX, faster to the pin. Yeah. Um, there's, there's specific examples over the years, like even Mahmoudi with Maruf at Iran, like for a while there, they were playing so fast to the right side that I, I think that was really, really hard for a lot of people to manage. Um, that's just one example. People are playing with different aspects of their talent to see if they can leverage speed. Uh, I do see a lot of different uh, routes coming from the middle blockers these days. You know, what are they doing offensively? I I really wonder about just um, if you look at the opposite position, one of the benefits we've had with Matt playing on the right is that he can pass too. And so uh, as you mentioned, Leon, and the velocity of serve is probably the most important part of the game today. I think if you serve easy, the offenses are so good you're going to lose. And if you make too many service errors, you're going to lose. So it's, it's like you have to hit the ball hard and hope it goes in at enough of a rate. It's really, a, I think, a, a really challenging aspect of coaching. How do you strike that balance between the velocity necessary to score points at the highest level and, and yet have the efficiencies necessary from a service perspective? So I, I really wonder where that's going to go. But I think for us, being able to receive a four – is very valuable. Poland can do it with Curic. Italy can do it with Zaitsev. I think there's, it's not surprising to me that you're seeing some of the teams have a, a, somebody that used to play outside hitter or can pass the ball really well play, play it opposite just because I, I think it used to be said that you don't want four passers because that means you have an additional seam that you need to communicate and that creates problems. The more seams you have to manage, the, the, the more difficult it is. I just think the velocity of the, the, of the serves are such now that it's about making the space a little bit smaller. You, when Leon hits a ball into the seam with three passers, you're not going to pass it. You know, and there's, you can scheme all you want, but I, I just think we had 13 aces versus Serbia in this tournament in one match. Yeah. And so I think we're going to have to figure out ways to either just really scheme and, or how do you serve more aggressively with more variety? I mean, it becomes, a real battle from the service line. So I think there's probably a lot of conversations amongst coaches about how you pass and serve, which as we always say, are the most important parts of the game. I don't think that's changed. That's, that's what you said in all the blogs and all the posts that you said, it's like serve and pass, serve and pass. Yeah. And we'll do that. But so you still, you still see that as a, as a first ball set out kind of game for the next future, especially on, on, on the serve side, right? Yeah. I think what you're seeing now too, which is interesting for me is the ability to hit that ball off the top of the hands. And yep. now that you have instant replay, that is so effective. I mean, if you're watching instant replay with those slow motion cameras, you can get a little tick on one finger that a linesman never used to be able to see, and now you can see it. So you might probably start seeing a lot more of, of those types of swings because you're starting to have a higher success rate. Um, seeing a lot more of that, but uh, yeah, the game continues to change. Which is the fun part. Thank you. Yeah. So, so, so coach, uh, coach Sparrow nous explique effectivement le, l'évolution, le, le bic, la pipe, l'attaque en arrière euh, au poste 6, c'est une grosse évolution. La, euh, la rapidité de service avec Léon, il, il, 
est, est aussi euh, un, un, des, un des changements du jeu. Il pense que le, le service, ce qu'on appelle le service réception, va évoluer. Euh, il, nous a, il nous offre deux, deux choses. Il nous dit qu'un, avec des, des joueurs comme Léon qui servent à 130 km euh, heure par heure de service, il va falloir trouver une façon de réceptionner. C'est vrai que réceptionner à trois, c'est difficile. Donc, il essaye de voir s'il si, euh, ne peut pas mettre Matt Anderson en, en, en position de réception en tant qu'opposite pour avoir quatre, euh, quatre joueurs qui permettraient d'avoir bon, plus d'intermédiaires entre les joueurs, si vous voulez, mais au moins d'avoir quatre joueurs pour pouvoir réceptionner cette balle qui arrive très, très vite. Euh, il parle aussi du fait que le, le jeu masculin est toujours un jeu de service réception où il faut pouvoir servir assez fort sans faire d'erreur parce que plus vous faites d'erreur, moins vous allez gagner. Et si vous servez trop facile, vous allez reprendre la balle tout de suite. Euh, et finalement, ce qu'il expliquait, il disait que c'était très intéressant, c'est qu'avec euh, cette VNL-là, où on peut voir le joueur qui touche la balle euh, sur des balles hautes, euh, il va sans doute y avoir de plus en plus de joueurs qui vont taper très haut et très fort dans les mains, juste pour pouvoir toucher juste le petit bout du doigt et après appeler, euh, appeler le replay. Donc, c'est un, une des visions de, de John. We're going, to, uh, we're going to see if you're right, John. We're going to come back in a couple of years and, and see if you were right in your, in your prediction. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Very good. The, um, um, so uh, let's go back then maybe about the, uh, the Olympics. So you won a gold medal, right? Yeah. As, as an assistant coach, but you still won a gold medal. You, you did some, you didn't just sit there. Um, tell us, tell us what that team was that made it so successful. And I'll tell you why I'm asking that. So the French team in 2016 was one of the I wouldn't say they would win the gold, but they were a contender for one of the um, um, medal, right? And they, pardon my expression, they totally screwed up. But it screwed up for a couple of reasons. They didn't realize the intensity. They didn't realize that it was so um, so hard to play in the Olympics. So you played in the Olympics. You played in 2018. You played in 2016, and you got a medal there. What makes a team so good at the Olympics? Beside all that we talk about, the techni technical stuff, the mental, the grit, And, and the internal talk that you talk about. Tell us about that team in 2008, what you learned from that team that actually allow you to build a UCLA in that team now, that Olympic team. Uh, I do think um, what I learned from that group was, and, and we've talked about it before, is the, the leadership and the, um, the, the internal in, intrinsic, that, I, I don't know, They, they really wanted it themselves and they really were able to lead themselves in a lot of ways. And I, I think the pivotal player on that team was Loy Ball. Yeah. And Loy had, uh, he had a unique journey. He, he had been to a couple of Olympics that were not very successful. I think he shouldered a lot of the blame for the, the U.S. not doing very well at those Olympics And, um, but then he goes overseas and he wins the championship in Greece. When Greece was one of the top leagues, he wins in Italy, he wins in Russia. He, he just became very, very experienced. And I think with that experience gave him a tremendous amount of poise and, and calmness, which I don't think is how people would define Loy early in his career. And when he came to the Olympic games, He'd been through everything. So when there was a lot of stress and there was a lot of uncertainty, I just remember him being out on the court and he'd be saying, he said this all the time. He goes, we're fine. We're fine. Because he'd just been through so much. Yeah. And I think that that level of experience and, I mean, maybe the word is wisdom. I mean, maybe it's an overstatement, but I think in terms of just this environment, I think he, he gained a lot of perspective. And, and how to handle those, those pressure moments. And his poise in those moments, I think, was uh, really infectious for the entire team. Um, but I think you had a lot of guys that were experienced there too. Riley Salmon had been to the Olympics. Reed Pretty had been to the Olympics. Uh, Ryan Millar had been to the Olympics. Uh, Clay Stanley had been to the Olympics. The, the interesting thing about that team is I don't think they were the – the most purely talented team, but they just had a really, really good system. I mean, Riley and Reed and Rich Lamborn passed the ball. We talked about serving and passing. I mean, the truth is they passed the ball really, really well. Loy was a great setter, so he distributed a very evenly distributed offense. Yeah. 
Um, and then you had Clay Stanley and Riley was there. He wasn't going to serve bombs. He, at that point, he was serving in. Uh, Loy was kind of a halfway. You know, every once in a while, he'd get an ace. Reed, but Reed and, and then you had Clay. Now, Clay probably had, I don't remember the exact number, but it was somewhere around 40% errors. But who cared? Because the other 60% of the time, he was going to score a point. And so you had Clay, green light, go bomb away. And then we had really, really good walkers. I think uh, Loy was a big setter. And then you had uh, David Lee, who was a young player at that point, but always an exceptional blocker for Team USA the whole rest of his career, all the way through Rio. And, uh, and then Ryan Millar. So you had really, really good blockers. So I, I just think we were a real good ball control. We had – we kind of had an identity. We knew what that identity was. We had good internal leadership, and we just played our style of volleyball until it until it won. Yeah, I hear a lot of stuff. Ali, Ali, Ali from you, I hear experience, ball control, identity, leadership, and and really grit and wanting it, right? Which is yeah. which is when I think at, at one point when you're at twenty three, twenty three in the fifth set, mm-hmm. who knows, right? You, yeah, you want to be there, right? So belief, belief is another thing. How so? How do you coach that? How do you foster that? I mean, you, you can't tell them you have to believe, right? Yeah, I may, maybe. I, I wouldn't discount that to some degree. I think um, how you handle those moments and the pressure and, and what you're saying to yourself, how do you frame those moments? How do you learn from previous moments about what worked and didn't work? I mean, I think there is a lot of um, coaching that can go into those types of moments, and you can be opportunistic. Um, you can you can even see things occur in practice, and you can say, "Hey, that happened here. What what was the thought process? How can we be better in that moment?" And I think if you keep having those types of conversations, then it gives you something to talk about when it really matters. You know, I think. You, you lay the groundwork early on in a season or in the case of the national team because you're together for so long. You, you lay the groundwork years before. But sometimes those conversations about how to handle moments they don't really mean anything until it really is at the Olympic Games. And then people go, oh, yeah, you, you have talked to me about that before. <laughs> okay, now I get it. Uh, so I, I do think there is some really – to me, that's the, the fun part because you do get into these moments at the end and all of a sudden everything really matters and then there's – some real high level of focus on peak performance and achievement, you know, and as a coach, isn't that the business we're in? So I, I think this, yeah. is, this is the good stuff. This is, this is awesome. Don't, don't, um, don't lose that train of thought. because I'll come back to you about mental training there. I got a question already. Mm-hmm. Um, so que coach Spero nous explique, donc c'est que, um, il, euh, on, on parlait de, de l'équipe de 2008 dans laquelle il a gagné la, la médaille d'or. Il nous expliquait qu'en fait, c'était une équipe qui voulait vraiment gagner. Et il parlait juste de Lloyd, qui était le passeur, et qui disait que ce, cette personne-là, cette, cet athlète, était vraiment la personne qui a, qui a parlé de l'intérieur et qui a fait que c'était qui voulait vraiment gagner. C'était, c'était, alors, il y avait de l'expérience, il y avait de la volonté, de l'envie. C'était, en plus, c'était des bons joueurs, de bons serveurs, de bons bloqueurs, mais c'est vraiment ce côté, euh, ce côté envie. Et donc, je lui expliquais, je lui demandais comment on pouvait euh, entraîner ce côté d'envie. Il nous expliquait qu'en fait, c'est, une, c'est, c'est donc euh, un coaching sur le moment. C'est quand les choses se passent, que ce soit à l'entraînement ou dans les matchs. Euh, c'est, c'est toujours appliquer ce, cette, cette chose qui est euh, qu'est-ce que tu aurais fait dans ce moment-là pour que ça puisse avoir euh, de l'importance quand, quand c'est vraiment euh, le, le point des Jeux Olympiques. Euh, et donc, je vais poser cette question de, de Fred sur la culture de, de, de la gagne. Um, one of the person is asking that, let's face it, the USA, the United States, the team USA is our favorite enemy because this is a team that never, never, ever gives up. Right. Mentally, you're so strong. Uh, you're always there to perform and win. You can see that uh, even at the NCAA right? or, or at the national team. Um, what are the tools that you can tell us without actually spilling everybody and telling us how to win against you? But what are the mental tool that, that you work beside this in the moment to get the best of every athlete when it matters the most? Um. I think it's important to understand that every athlete has their own unique personality and thought processes and experiences that they bring to the game. Mm -hmm. And so it is, 
I know we all know about sports psychology and it's becoming more, much more prevalent in its usage. I think it's very effective, but sometimes I see sports psychologists come and work with a team and they, they give a general talk. The team sits there, the guy talks about self-talk. Okay. So what are you saying to yourself? Well, you know, there's probably, I don't know if you have 20 people there, there's probably three or four or five people where what he's talking about resonates with them. There's another 15 people that are like, yeah, that's not me, you know? And, and so I think it really does require quite a bit of understanding for each individual athlete and what they need and how to provide that. And then I just think there is the general values and culture that you're creating by encouraging the proper behaviors. And those are collective behaviors. So you have the you have the individual mental processes and then you have the collective culture or behaviors that the team has. And I, I think that can be collaborative with the players, but it can also come from the coaching staff. I've done it both ways. Um, but I think that the, the U S is interesting because I think um, there is a, a general American culture that I think is that, that, we're kind of just born with a little, not born with, I think we absorb and when we're growing up and we're playing sports. And I just think that there's such a culture of sport and competition and it goes right down to how we operate our, our economy. You know, like, I think we just, you grow up in a intensely competitive environment, right? I mean, it is, and it is something that when, when you're growing up, your parents are talking to you about hard work. Cause if you don't work, really hard, you're going to have a tough time in the United States. It's going to be tough. And uh, so I think, you know, we work really hard. And I think the the national team, the players, they work really hard because that's just kind of what's expected when you're American. And uh, and so I I do think we can be pretty feisty uh, about that. And I do think we have a really good collective work ethic. I think we really do that. And, And our guys are committed. I mean, that's just, they're really, really committed. It's hard. I think it's, it's hard for our players to make the decision to be a professional volleyball player because they have to go overseas to Europe and be away from their families for eight months. And so when they make that commitment, they're in, they're all in. And uh, so I think we've got a really committed group of professionals who work exceptionally hard. And then we've developed a team culture that I think is really effective for us. We've developed that over eight years. And then I think we do a good job of making sure we understand who our individual athletes are and give them what they need and the tools they need to reach peak performance. So it's very interesting. Before I translate, I, I love what you said. We, we talked to uh, um, Giovanni Guidetti a couple of weeks ago. And it, I know it's a, it's a women coaching, but he said he was, before every game, he was going to each and every athlete when they were, before, when they were warming up and just having a little, hey, how are you doing today? You yeah, know, this is what you're going to, you know what I mean? Yeah, um, okay. is it, it takes is a this, lot of time. Coaching today, I know. I know. Coaching today takes a lot of time. Yeah. I mean, I know fellow coaches in the United States at the university level who are like, yeah, I just, all I do now is I, I plan practice and then I just have coffees, <laughs> individual meetings with players. All yeah. Day. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I, I think that's what's required these days. It, I think the, the old school coaches probably look at that and, and they're frustrated by it. Um, I'm a little bit of a tweener because I grew up in an environment that was very different and I've had to adapt yep. and I'm continuing to recognize that I need to adapt more and how I manage my time in order to do that, I think is really, really important. Um, I think at the end of the day, it really challenges us to be better coaches because what are we trying to do? We're trying to just give our athletes the best opportunity to win and, and that's going to change and it'll change 10 years from now again. You know, it'll, it's going to continue to evolve like the game. You know, you asked about how the game is evolving. The game's going to evolve. The athletes are going to evolve. The mentality is going to evolve. evolve. And if you want to be a coach that's relevant, you're going to have to evolve too. Very good. Let me uh, let me first let um, um, Coach Perro nous explique uh, uh, à propos de, de, du mental et de questions. Il disait qu'en fait, chaque athlète a sa propre personnalité. Et donc, il, il, il voit ça en, en, dans une espèce de triptyque qui est un, comprendre la tête, l'athlète. Euh, directement, euh, au lieu de parler, au lieu d'avoir des gens qui parlent du mental sur un groupe de 20 personnes, mais vraiment parler directement à chaque athlète et understand et comprendre pourquoi l'athlète est là. Euh, après, cette, cette vision de, de, de comportement collectif euh, d'une équipe, il faut qu'une équipe se comporte 
ensemble de la même façon. C'est le deuxième de son triptyque. Et puis le troisième, c'est la, la culture américaine. Euh, si vous ne connaissez pas, c'est d'une culture euh, euh, extrêmement compétitive déjà depuis le départ où les, les, en, les parents poussent les enfants à, à, à travailler très très fort. Donc c'est euh, dès le départ aux, aux États-Unis, il y a une culture de la compétition qui est innée. Euh, et, puis, euh, et puis ensuite, il nous explique aussi que ces athlètes-là, comme ce sont des athlètes qui vivent aux États-Unis et qui jouent en Europe, ben, ils sont loin de leur famille pendant huit mois de l'année, hein, que ce soit à Zenith Kazan, que ce soit en Italie. Et donc ce sont des, des, des gens qui sont extrêmement dédi dédiés dédié qui veulent qui veulent euh, euh, réussir. Uh, thank you coach. I'm going to actually then now get a couple of questions from the people who are listening to us. I'm trying to get their term. Um, and it's uh, it's interesting because it's about your your feedback about the the VNL teams and the Olympic uh, teams. Um, um, let me see. I'll have to translate. It's all in French. Um, <laughs> uh, okay. Um, Now that the Olympic Games were actually moved from 20 to 21, did it change your preparation and your team? And is the um, um, is is the fact that you're in a bubble can change um, the, the 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 behavior? I can't even translate the behavior of the team and other teams in Tokyo. So I think the question is about with COVID, what changed from 20 to 21? Did it change your composition of your team, how you prepare, and do you think it's going to impact the Olympic Games? Um, yes, I think to all of those, I think, um, I think it changed the composition of our team. I mean, if the Olympics had happened in 2020, we probably would not have had Taylor Sander because his shoulder was injured yeah. and we probably would have had Aaron Russell <laughs> Yeah. and, uh, TJ DeFalco had a, I think really a great year overseas. He's become a much more impactful player for us. I think he, sometimes we see a significant jump in abilities for our athletes after their second year playing professionally. Interesting. I think the university university system, and we could talk about this for a long time, but the university system in the United States is just a very, very different system than what you have in Europe. And yep. there's some, there's some real benefits. And then there's some other things that guys have to make adaptations and the levels higher. And so they gain a lot from the university experience. That's unique. Um, but then there's this adaptation when they go away from home, they're playing at a higher level and it takes a couple of years. That's second year when they're overseas. And this happened with TJ and, and, and Kyle Ensing. I, I don't yeah. know what happened a year ago with Kyle, but I mean, both those guys are significantly better this year. Significantly. We, we saw that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Kyle, goodness, guys playing great. So, yeah. uh, so yes, our, our, our team would have been different. Our training is different because, I think they're, the, the training in the national team is always a little unique because you, you don't have as much training time as you might think. <laughs> you, they, they're overseas for eight months. They come back. They need a little. They, they need some time off. And then you get into VNL, which doesn't usually allow for a lot of training. Then you take another little break, and then you ramp up for whatever the final tournament is at the end of the year, whether that's World Champs or World Cup or the Olympic Games. And Um, if you have some other zones, the European Championships, Norsecas for us, uh, maybe the Olympic qualifiers, there's just not a lot of time to train. So now you not only don't have a lot of time to train, but now you haven't seen your players for two years. So as we went into this preparation for VNL, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out what the best strategies were, what the best training program was going to be to simply get everybody on the same page. What is our systems? How does everybody understand what our systems are? How do we get everybody coordinated with our systems? I mean, we just spent a very intentional focused amount of time on that. And that was really highly focused because we knew, but we had very little time. You know, you had two weeks VNL, which hasn't allowed very much training time. You're gonna have two weeks to go to the Olympics. I, This is a super interesting challenge for coaches right now. Um, and, and then you get to the bubble. So the third part of that question is, does the bubble change things? I think in general that COVID and the last year has been very, very stressful for people. Uh, maybe that's stating the obvious, but there's been a lot of isolation, a lot of loneliness, a lot of stress, a lot of uh, anxiety, um, a lot of injuries as players were off for a long time and tried to come back and play. A lot of our players got COVID in the middle of the year and then didn't have enough ramp up time in their professional leagues. They were put right back into volleyball matches when they were cleared to do so that had, so we've had to manage health 
a little differently. Um, so I, I just think that if teams can handle that, that aspect of the development of their athletes and make sure that they're doing well, I think that that's beneficial. And so I, I, I look around, I see teams that seem to be doing well. I, I think people are making the right decisions about how they're managing their teams. I think teams are the best teams in the world are still the best teams in the world and they're, they're talented and they're going to go out there and they're going to go compete really hard. And I, so I think the bubble is a unique, how do you manage this? How do you manage your teams? For us, I didn't have a choice. I just kind of went with what the circumstances were for me. And I don't think that's going to change at the Olympic games. Listen, we're not going to have, we're, we're probably not going to have Aaron Russell. You know, yeah. like, and so we're going to have to have, TJ DeFalco or somebody come in and step into that place and play well in order for us to, to be successful. We're going to have to have other players step up. We have that ability. Okay. Matt Anderson didn't play this year. In some respects, Matt's come back. He's been better, but he also isn't as comfortable on the volleyball court. Right? And we've got to get this all together in a few weeks. It's a, it's a really, it's a unique challenge. That's that's the fun of coaching, right? I mean, uh, yeah. but you know, I mean, this is and who knows, people will rise. We know that we have heroes that rise through the, the Olympic Games. So, mm -hmm. thank you. Let me let me translate that quickly. So, ce que, le, ce que Coach Bones explique, c'est que effectivement, euh, um, effectivement, l'équipe aurait été différente. Ils auraient eu Aaron Russell en 2020. Ils ont TJ Sanders cette année alors qu'ils l'auraient pas eu l'année d'année d'après. Et ils se rendent compte que on pourrait en parler de de de, de l'université américaine. Ils se rendent compte que les, les joueurs deviennent vraiment performants deux ans après de sortir de l'université et en jouant en équipe dans l'équipe d'Europe. Et donc, ils parlent de Elgins, ils parlent de De Falco, euh, qui sont des joueurs qui seraient sans doute pas, du, pas eu pendant les années 2020. Après, il parle ensuite au-dessus de, de, de ce hiatus, si vous voulez, qui s'est passé entre 2020 et 2021, où en fait, il n'a pas vu les joueurs pendant presque un an et demi, et, et donc il a fallu leur réapprendre le système, réapprendre la coordination, re, re, se reconnecter avec eux. Donc c'est vrai que c'était très, très différent. Ils ont passé énormément de temps de ce côté-là. Et puis finalement, cette bulle, cette bulle sanitaire, c'est vrai que ça, ça, impacte, bah, ça a impacté les gens. Ils étaient isolés, ils étaient stressés, il y a eu de l'anxiété. Donc, il a fallu reprendre ces joueurs, manager, gérer, si vous voulez, la santé des joueurs. Et il se dit que les équipes qui vont y aller sont l'équipe qui pourront effectivement gérer euh, la, la, la santé des joueurs. Uh, thank you, coach. I'm, I'm checking the time right now. We're almost at the end, right? Um, I got a last question. Um, Olympic Games, you look at the pool. We call it the pool of death, right? Mm -hmm. um, thoughts, no thoughts, one game at a time? One game at a time. One game at a time. I don't – yeah, one game – you're right. It is the pool of death. I think um, the teams that can survive that are going to be better in the playoffs. It's – so you just have to look at it as uh, an opportunity to position yourself to, to win a medal. and. If you survive it, you're going to be in a better place. And if you don't survive it, you're just going to go home. It's, it's just not – it's sport, you know. And, and so you have to frame that in your mind as a great opportunity. And I think for us, it is. I, I think we – Team USA at this moment in time needs the stress. We have to have it. And so that's either – we're either – we have two paths. We're either – not going to have enough time to put it together with the team that we have, with the injuries that we've had, with the circumstance we've had. We're not going to have enough time. We're not going to win. Yeah. Or we're at the stress of the pool of death is going to teach us what we need to know in order for us to be successful for the playoffs and, and for the gold medal or for the medal matches. And so if we can survive that, we can be in a nice position uh, for the medal rounds. And And that's, that's our choice, you know, that's, and I think the only thing we can do right now is to figure out how to win the first point versus France. You know, I mean, that's all we're thinking about. And, and I, we know that winning the first point against France is going to be very hard. <laughs> so yeah. I think it's, uh, that's our challenge. It's the same challenge for all these teams. I think the level of volleyball on the men's side internationally right now is just exceptional. It really is. It, it, it's awesome to be a part of it's uh, you watch all these teams, look at our pool and it's just, it's going to be one point here and one point there and there's no bad teams, but a good team is going to go home. And, yeah. and that's just the way that this tournament will go. It'll, it'll be great for the sport. It'll be uh, great for volleyball, great for the Olympics. And, and for one team, it'll be a, a gold medal experience and it'll be interesting to see which team that is.
Thank you very much. That's great. Um, I'd like to thank you for your time. Um, I think it's, it's a time and we really appreciate that. Um, I got some people that are um, uh, in France that are uh, coaching the, uh, the deaf team. I just want to say hi to uh, oh, David Smith. So if you yeah, can, if you can absolutely. tell David Smith, yeah, that is, is just one of the example for that, for that team. They're just, uh, and for all of us, because he's, he's a great middle blocker anyway. Uh, but just the fact that he's that. So say hi to him from the, from the team that just followed him. Yeah, um, I, and, uh, I know he'll really appreciate that. He's such a, a wonderful person and a great volleyball player. And I've been fortunate enough to coach David all those years in, at university before the national team. Yeah. So uh, I'm proud of him. Uh, you don't really think about his disability very much because he just has learned and we've all learned how to adapt to how he can't hear it in a volleyball match when his hearing aids go out. And um, the good news is he is a really good volleyball player. So if, if, if he can't hear somebody calling for the ball and he's going to set it, it doesn't matter because it's going to be a good set. So we're in, we're in good hands when David's touching the ball. That's a good thing. Thank you so much. Oh, I just got a text there from a person named Laurent who said, can you ask Coach Spero what lineup he will play against us? <laughs> oh, hold on. Sorry. No, I meant what lineup he will play against the French team. Yeah. Just, no. just a joke. Just a joke. No, we heard no, you at the timeout. Tell him we'll grab coffee and, uh, and, <laughs> and uh, we'll talk, talk about it. Yeah, I, I tell you what, I it is fun, this this uh the fraternity of volleyball coaches and, and people and players and being in BNL has been really fun because we're all together. Uh, obviously I have a great relationship with the Tillies because I coached Kevin in, in university yeah. and Laurent came out and, and was in our gym for a long time. So I really, it, it's, it was really fun for me to see the Tillies and I, right. The first day we were here, Laurent came in, I, I said, hello, he, we sat down and had coffee. And uh, so I, I think it's uh it, it's really enjoyable to be a part of this community and to be a part of uh, the sport, which I, it's a great part of the sport. There's a lot of great people involved. And it's, it's, it's an honor to be a part of it. You're, you're one of them. Uh, you're one of the mentor and people that everybody look uh, up to, me included. So thank you for your time. We really appreciate that. We wish you all the luck up to the final, of course, because we'll play you again in the final. But no, we're, seriously, we wish you all the luck. Um, we're so grateful that you uh, share all this wisdom and this knowledge with us. We hope to talk to you soon. Go have your dinner. Enjoy yes. your pizza, pizza pasta. Let's hope. Um, Let's hope it's pizza. That'd be okay. Thanks, Coach. Happy Father's Day. Have a great day. Talk yes. to you later, Happy Coach. Happy Father's Day, Thanks everyone. So yeah. Thank you. Ciao. Thank, Thank you. Everybody. Thank you very much. Euh, Christophe, si tu peux revenir, hein, remet, re, retraduire un peu. Euh, oui, les, oui, oui, oui. Alors, il a, alors il, a, il, a, il a parlé, je, je suis en train de, de regarder, il a, il a, il a parlé, je l'ai laissé par, partir parce que je ne voulais pas. Oui, il, oui, a parlé, euh, euh, il a parlé, il a dit que l'équipe des États-Unis avait besoin de stress en ce moment, hein, qu'effectivement, la, la, la poule de la mort, comme on l'appelle, c'est une poule où ben, une de très, très bonnes équipes internationales va, va partir. Et il disait que le challenge pour l'équipe euh, des États-Unis en ce moment, c'est avec tout, tous les tous ces problèmes qu'ils ont et ces blessures, c'est d'engendrer de, ce stress pour ces joueurs pour qu'ils puissent se surpasser euh, et être les, les, les meilleurs du monde. Et il dit, bah, soit on n'aura pas assez de temps et, et on ne va pas pouvoir le faire, soit au contraire, bah, comme on n'a pas Aaron Russell, il va falloir que De Falco se mette à jouer, il va falloir qu'on ait des joueurs qui se surpassent et se subliment. Et c'est dans ces moments-là où on peut avoir une équipe, euh, une équipe phénoménale. Euh, après, je l'ai un, un peu piqué, je lui ai dit que j'avais mmh. reçu un texte de Laurent T., qui demandait quel était, euh, quel était le 6 de départ, <rire> lequel n'a pas répondu. On a vu pendant, pendant le, le, le temps mort contre la France qu'il ne voulait pas parler, qu'il ne voulait pas en écouter. Donc Mais il connaît très bien Antti, puisqu'il a entraîné euh, Kevin à, à, en Californie, et il connaît très bien Laurent. Et il disait aussi que le niveau, en ce moment, le niveau international des, des équipes internationales était, euh, était phénoménal au niveau masculin. Euh, donc voilà, je, je vais citer, je vais remercier pour son, pour son temps. Et la, je ne sais le... pas, Shafiq, s'il y avait d'autres thèmes ouais. que tu voulais que je traduise ouais, le, le, le petit mot par rapport à David Smith, c'était intéressant aussi. Oui, oui, oui. Alors, effectivement, j'ai dit, et c'est vrai que c'est très intéressant parce que David, il est tellement bon qu'on ne se rend même pas compte qu'il n'entend pas bien, qu'il n'entend plus du tout. Euh, parce que c'était un joueur qui est euh, au même niveau, sinon plus haut que la plupart des, des, des milieux. Donc, pour eux, ils ne le voient pas. Et, et euh, c'est vrai qu'il est très content. Il a entraîné David aussi. Euh, en UCLA, donc il lui passera, il lui passera le bonjour, et c'est vrai que c'est un très très bon joueur de volleyball, c'est une personne très agréable à entraîner, euh, et puis on sait qu'il disait à la fin, il disait que de toute façon quand il y aura un set, comme il ne sait pas où la balle va aller, il, on sait que David il sera là, puisque <rire> je ne l'entends pas, donc il va y aller, il va y aller à 100%, donc voilà ce qu'il nous expliquait sur, euh, sur David. Parfait, ben, merci beaucoup, on a, on a fait le tour, euh, Christophe, euh, c'était super, moi je me suis euh, régalé,